currently a visiting prof professor from UC Berkeley. Uh, he's on campus teaching a course called Ventures to Address Global Health Challenges. He's worked as an entrepreneur, a management consultant, a lawyer, and a senior executive. And he's also worked with Intel to encourage women and youth entrepreneurship. Please give a warm welcome to the developer of the concept of TED University, Mr. John Danner. Thank you. The world needs not just disruption, but eruption. Everybody here, everybody here today, and everybody watching potentially on video should identify with this number. Because we're part of the two billion people who benefited from the two previous revolutions of business innovation. The first, the Industrial Revolution, taught us how to make things more efficiently in the physical world. The second taught us how to create and communicate things in the virtual world. And we benefited from both. Now we benefited because we listened to one of the pieces by this guy, Adam Smith. Now Adam Smith is every academic's dream. He once said about his ideal profession of being a moral philosopher, observe everything, do nothing. <laughs> now we took his ideas, division of labor, mastering self-interest, the invisible hand marketplace, and we built an amazing record of world economic growth. In the last 50 years alone, we went from about $2 trillion to about $17 trillion in less than two generations. Wonderful accomplishment. We have a lot to be proud of. Capitalism has a lot to be proud of. The difficulty is that most of that growth, most of that growth has occurred at the top of the economic pyramid of the world, above people who make $10 a day. That leaves, by process of mathematics, about 5 billion people below us who live on, on average, $10 a day, half of whom live on about $2.50 a day. In other words, we've done a great job of helping 2 billion people get wealthy at the top of the pyramid in roughly 20 countries, but haven't yet figured out how to share the benefits of those first two revolutions with the 5 billion people living in the other 175 countries in the world. We didn't listen to the second work by this guy, because it was all about the underlying morality of markets, about how our interest in our own self-interest should be governed also by a mutual sense of self-interest for those less fortunate than we. That's the other that Adam Smith talked about. So the question before us, I think, is how are we going to figure out a way to share the benefits of economic prosperity, of technical and scientific innovation, with the five billion people who live just below us? And are we going to be able to do that before our time, and potentially our planet, runs out? Now, I'm trying to figure out how to dramatize exactly what the magnitude of this problem is, which I think is the core of what I would characterize as the third industrial innovation, challenge, and revolution, namely the inclusion revolution. Now just imagine for the moment that we were a community of 100 people, and these are five equal quintiles of this world of 7 billion that we have, but boiled down to a group of 100. And I wanted to just ask one question. Where does income get distributed? across this community of 100. And it looks something like this. Now, economists and demographers have looked at this chart for years and have said it reminds them of a champagne glass. I look at it, and I suspect many people in that 5 billion group look at it a little bit differently. They see something that looks more like this. <laughs> and they wonder about it and they think, hmm, maybe this is a model that allows the top to pop the cork on the bottle, while the people below them feel like they're getting screwed. <laughs> now this is a setup for a battle that is monumental, a battle of isms. Ours is not the only one. We have capitalism competing for the message to these five billion people. We have fascism, there's socialism, communism, and then of course you see all the time extremism. All of them have messages to these five billion people. If ours is going to win the day, we're going to have to do a much better job 
of harnessing the power of innovation, of releasing the power of innovation and entrepreneurship for the benefit and with the activity, the, act, the actual cooperation of those five billion people. Now, almost everyone in the world has great ideas for improving their lives or the, or the conditions in the world. But why is it that so few seem to be willing to test those ideas, to potentially start new ventures, to pursue those ideas? I think it comes down initially to how we think about innovation. Because in ideas and innovation drive entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship drives economic opportunity. So I think we have to start with some of our barriers to how we think about innovation. Now, it's always risky to talk about new ways of thinking about innovation, but let me take a stab at it. Because I think to some extent, most of us are in a box when we think about what innovation means and therefore what we expect of other people. Think about this word for a second. I'll wait. What comes to mind? What words? What examples? What people come to mind when you think about the word innovation? Chances are many of us started backwards. We started by thinking about omission. We started thinking about really big innovations from really famous people. The difficulty with that is that most of those are obvious in retrospect, but not when they began to get started. Some of us may have thought a little differently. Some of us may have thought about brand new, the aha moment of innovation. And we might have had in our mind somebody like this, somebody who changed how the world thinks about issues, thinks about reality. The difficulty is if we use either of those two definitions as our starting point, we might as well say to 99.99% of the world that number one, you can't be an innovator. You're not going to be an innovator. It's something that somebody else needs to do. Now, why don't we start on the front of this word? By recognizing that all innovation is contextual. It depends on what is innovating in the culture, in the moment, in the market, in the time. It may be things like Moussin Sarrar, the founder of Crafty Design. He's changing the traditional three stone fire, an unhealthy, unsafe practice used by almost half the world with a new design that is the most efficient cook stove of its kind in the world. But we might want to really think about the real beginning of this one. How can we make it easier for every person to think of themselves as potentially capable of innovation, to see themselves as innovators? Maybe it's people that are unexpected, like the auto mechanic from Argentina, Jorge Adon, who invented out of an inspiration from a YouTube video, a new device that may save tens of thousands of women's lives in difficult childbirth. Now, this is innovation. If we really want people to get out of their boxes, to become something other than donters, canters, wonters, and doubters, then we've got to think differently about this concept of innovation. And I've got an idea. Think about it the way we think about soccer or football. Everybody in this audience and I suspect most of the people looking at this on the web have the experience of playing soccer, watching soccer, knowing the fundamental rules of soccer, know what it feels like to try to kick a ball or defend a ball coming at you. We know what that experience is like. So why don't we think about innovation? Why don't we think about innovation the way we think about football, the way we think about soccer? And I'll suggest a working definition that I think may be a bit more invitational. And that is that innovation is really something better that advances something else that matters. Now, that's a very broad definition. But it's a broad definition because we want to invite 5 billion people into this innovation game along with us at the top of the pyramid. Now, that's innovation. I want to also talk about entrepreneurship because although not all innovators want to become entrepreneurs, some want to become artists or writers, scholars of some sort. But few do want to become entrepreneurs, and every entrepreneur is an innovator. So why are we blocking the zeal for entrepreneurship around the world? What are the barriers? How do we make it easier for people to become entrepreneurs? And I want to give you six examples of the barriers, 
six targets about what we might do against those barriers. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and I'm going to do all that in six minutes. All right. First, what are the barriers? I think there's six of them. First, it starts with imagination. People need to see themselves as innovators. Rarely do people do what they can't dream of doing first. They need to see people like themselves becoming entrepreneurs or innovators. It doesn't do any good to read always about Silicon Valley. If you're living in Mumbai, or you're living in the Barrio, or you're living in the favela Via de Janeiro, that doesn't do any good. Show me people like myself. Show me people who believe like I believe, who grew up the way I believe, who speak the same language, who believe the same religion. Show me people like that. It may be that I just don't know what it takes to start a business, or run a business, or grow a business. It may be that I have inertia, that it's hard to take the first step. It may be that I can't find other people doing the same thing that I'm doing. I'm too isolated. And finally, government rarely makes it easy for us to start, run, or grow a business. So what can we do about these barriers? Let me suggest six of them. First, Make it possible, make it possible for girls, boys, men, and women to first imagine that they can do this as entrepreneurs. Seven, show them people like themselves in YouTube videos, on the web, in conversations. Show people that people like themselves are making these changes, are converting their ideas, their innovations into ventures that can provide employment, provide opportunity for themselves, their family, their communities, and their world. Package in different ways practical how-to information, that tools that can give entrepreneurs the ability to take the first step, to get their ideas converted into those early startup ventures. Think about how we can deal with helping people take the very first step, the very first step in this process. Show me how to find other tools and other teams that are working on this in this same area. Make it possible for me to connect and possibly show government, help government figure out simpler ways to get these ventures started. Now, I told you I was going to give you a couple of possible examples. Let me give you one at the end. The world of Eve. Imagine if every campus, every community, every country had something as simple as a roadmap. Perhaps it's a physical roadmap, perhaps it's a virtual roadmap available on cell phones or iPads or tablets, but it's a way of orienting students and people interested in entering the world of innovation and entrepreneurship, where they can find re those resources, how they can make those connections. And if you want to go further, think about putting some of the tools and resources that are already available on the web, put them in people's hands. Make it possible for them to find and access the practical tools and resources necessary to start the business, to convert an idea into a vision, to pursue their dreams and their vision. Put it in their hands. Create something like an e-board using a familiar customer interface like the keyboard. All of these things are not necessary, are necessary, excuse me, but not sufficient. What we really are trying to create is an opportunity to get us out of this box and create an arena in which ideas and innovation can be multiplied by the power of entrepreneurship. Not for the two billion of us that are already benefiting from those first two revolutions, but for the five billion people living below us on less than $10 a day. We can't afford to wait, and they shouldn't they should not wait to afford what we already take.